Wow. Good evening. I'm Power of Silver Alcohol. My name is Dave Fredrickson. And uh, you all see the jacket and the tie? My sponsor taught me a long time ago. You represent Alcoholics Anonymous, you wear a jacket and a tie. All right. Uh, Beverly, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And uh, John and Rhea, wherever you guys are, thank you so much for the invitation. There you guys are right there for, for coming down here. And if you ever need a host, Robert's the man. He has just been calling me every single morning. What do you guys need? Where are you? And he gave me things. The, the one warning I would give you about him is he sent me for lunch. It was, I think it was about 95 miles round trip. <laughs> But let me tell you, it was some of the best food I have eaten on the island. Fantastic. Uh, you know, in Texas-sized portions as well. Um, and I'd also like to thank Glenn. Uh, Glenn and Jane, one of the things you'll hear about uh, me is in early in sobriety was I was a tape junkie. Um, back when they had, the, for those young people, the things they were like called cassettes, and you stuck them in the machine, and the tape would get all bound up, and then you'd cry because you, you lost your favorite tape. You know, you take a pencil and you twist it backwards, those things. <clears throat> huge part of my sobriety was getting sober listening to people on tape when I would travel and because I don't know about anybody in this room but I have one of those minds where the hamster gets on the wheel and you're thinking a thousand things at once and you know one of the ways that I could combat that was to throw in a tape and listen to somebody else talk and it would kind of calm me down and you know um, <clears throat> and it was uh, it was a big piece and uh, matter of fact I was just talking to a guy uh, t this morning and the way I met him was I'd done a series of tapes back in, uh, gosh, I think 2000, and Glenn had recorded it. And one of his friends had gave him tape or CD number three out of a 10 CD set. And he plugged it into his car, and he was in a really bad space in his sobriety. And uh, it saved his life. And he reached out to a, the other guy that we, I was doing the workshop with. And so I can't speak highly enough for the people that tape our, our uh our recovery and and spread the message around because there are places um, as you'll hear about later on in my story where the message still hasn't gotten there and um, and they survive on tapes and it's an invaluable service it's made a huge difference in my sobriety uh, <clears throat> uh, and I feel right at home here this is wonderful because in Texas time it's uh, 2 18 in the morning you know and that's you know, for us bar drinkers, that's when, you know, we just start getting going. The party just starts firing up. Um, one of the things that I always like to ask, is there anybody that's at a, their very first ever AA meeting? No? Okay. Because one of the things, I always ask that question, because every once in a while you get somebody that just wanders in, it's their very first meeting, we hook them up with a big book. Because that's what they did with me when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Very, very important. Um, and... Uh, just so you guys have a little bit of background, uh, I grew up in an alcoholic household. You know, it's a family disease. Genetically, I guess, contaminated gene pool, I don't know. I mean, there's alcoholics up and down the family tree on both sides of the family. Um, on my mom's side of the house, there was eight brothers and sisters, and all of them were either alcoholic or married alcoholics. You know, so uh, it's just part of what I know and, and love growing up that way. And um, the the chaos that ensued in our, my household growing up was the classic chaos that you would expect in an active alcoholic household. And one of the things you learn as a kid growing up in that environment at a very young age is the power of alcohol. Because, you know, when dad came home, it didn't matter what, what time it was, it didn't matter if dinner was sitting on the table and it was getting cold, it was cocktail hour. So we'd stop whatever we were doing when dad had his cocktail before dinner because that's what sophisticated people did. And... You know, we'd all be hungry, waiting, ready to go, all, all five kids, and we'd be waiting for my father, you know, and that eventually as that progressed, my mom found Al-Anon, and then, of course, dinner would be in the oven with aluminum foil over it, and we would eat without him and go on with our lives. But when he would come home, you'd stop. The whole house would freeze, and you'd kind of take the temperature test, you know. Is he in a good mood or is he in a bad mood? What's going on? And that kind of determined how you felt and how you were going to react. So I knew there was something about this, this magic elixir that was in these, these big bottles. And, and growing up as a kid, my dad decided he wanted to be a gentleman farmer, so he bought this, this farm. And, and, you know, he had five kids, so we became the farm workers, you know, throwing rocks and driving tractors. And um, at the end of the day, he would always get two quarts of Pabst Blue Ribbon brought out to him if he was outside working. And 
I always volunteered for that job because he would start on one and he'd always let you pop the top and start on the other one. And as a little kid, you know, it made you feel really big and, and proud. But for me, it was that warm sensation, you know, the, the, the tingle in the back of your throat and your face would flush. And, you know, after a while, he kind of knocked that off because I would be polishing off too much of the second one before he could get to it. So <clears throat> I should have seen or known that there was going to be a problem down the road. But it, it was... Uh, it was a wonder way, wonderful way to grow up, but strange things happened. You know, uh, we had this, the house was built in the 1700s, like 1748 or something, and uh, it was uh, an old fashioned stone foundation. Hand, we still have the same well. It's a hand dug, hand lined stone well in the house, and, you know, it was, my parents renovated this farmhouse, and it has slate roof on it, and those slate roofs last for like a couple hundred years. And, Dad went off and got drunk and came home one night with a, a slate roof guy and they tore the roof off as a kid growing up and it was like late October, early November in New Jersey and, and of course they got part of the roof torn off and then of course the sun went down and we just put tarps over the house and staked stakes in the front and the backyard and we lived that way for a couple of years with ropes going over the top of the roof. So it was one of those environments where you kind of got the idea that alcohol had some power but there's some negative consequences that come along with it that you really kind of have to watch yourself. And so I started making those mental notes of what to do, what not to do. And, and you know, I'll do those things, have the fun, but I'm not going to get stupid and do those other things. Little did I know that that's really not an option. You know, uh, once you take the first one, you're on your own. Off you go. Um, and as a kid growing up, I always felt like something was wrong. You know, inside, it was one of, like, one of those things where you always felt like there was a playbook to life and everybody else got the playbook except you and you, you kind of sat back and watched what was going on and trying to figure it out and then you join in once you kind of figured out the whole game and how it's played. And that's how I felt as a kid growing up. And, and I was always the kid that wanted attention because at home you didn't get the... If you got attention, sometimes it was good attention, but a lot of times it was negative attention. So you learned, you know, the nail that sticks up gets hammered. You just kind of... You, you, you kind of hung down low and you didn't want to make waves and, and that's just the way you lived. But at school, I wanted to be the big man. So you know, I did th crazy things like at kindergarten, I, I, uh, I brought shotgun shells for kindergarten, show and tell, that kind of stuff. And that'll get you to the principal's office. And these days, it'll get you expelled. But back then, you know, they're like, oh, you know, where'd you get the shells? And, and it, it was one of the things that changed my life. Because that little event, um, it got me noticed by the teachers. And it was in a negative way. But it was, I got noticed. And that was one of the things that I was always looking for, is to get noticed, get some recognition that I am, I'm alive, I'm here. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I noticed that if you beat up kids on the playground, because the if you didn't know, when you were out on the playground with me, those were my things that we were playing with, you know. So I'd climb up on the top and we'd play King of the Mountain. Whether you guys wanted to play or not, I was King of the Mountain. So, um, and I've always been big my entire life. So after a while, they just decided to send me to, to the principal's office. And there was this wonderful little lady, and she would always, um, some of you are old enough to remember the mimeograph machines. You know, you actually had to crank the thing. And she would always have little jobs like that. And... It was unconditional love by that woman, and it was a phenomenal deal for me because it was a turning point. I realized that there was, there was love and care outside of the chaos and craziness of an alcoholic family. So um, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of stories and drunk logs, but it, 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 the two pieces are I knew that something was wrong inside of me. I didn't feel right, and alcohol could make that feeling go away for a short period of time. And so I was on a quest to go have as much fun as my father, and I saw my father having. And I did it as often as I could get away with as a kid growing up. And the older I got, the easier it got because my father's drinking got worse. And as his drinking got worse, he spent more and more time away from home. And he was, by trade, he was an airline pilot. And he had this little gentleman farm. And so he'd go off on these trips for three or four days. And, of course, that left his, kip, his uh, liquor cabinet vulnerable. And, you know, we'd, we'd go in there and hit the liquor cabinet, and he was a blackout drinker, so a lot of times he'd say, you know, I thought I had, you know, two cases of Pabst, and now I only find one. And, well, you, I don't know, Dad. It, it, it was one of those things where we would steal his cigarettes and we'd steal his booze, and, and uh, my drinking got progressively worse as a kid growing up. And, uh, and the parties got crazier, because, you know, he started getting, I found out after the fact, he started getting thrown out of bars and stuff. And so 
he loved Dixieland jazz, and in downtown in our, our town, they'd have this Dixieland jazz band, and he'd bring the jazz band home, and he'd wake us up in the middle of the night, and we'd go out on the farm and boil corn, and, and they'd be playing and bring a keg, and, you know, and it was always the sense of adventure that I was always looking for, because he'd, you know, the other kids would kind of roll over, but I would always get up and go down and hang out with my dad and his friends out by the pond in this big bonfire, and to me that was like magical. It was, it was part of the quest that I would always be looking for, you know, and we'd go do things like go over to the neighbor farm and steal watermelons, you know, and unless my dad was really drunk, and then one day we came home with a whole entire pickup truck load full of green pumpkins, and, you know, it's kind of hard to eat green pumpkins, but it, 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 to me that was, that was exciting, that was fun. You know, and, and he'd have these parties, and I'd watch him, you know, one night I watched him pour gasoline on his boots and climb up in the, the loft of the barn and light, lit his boots on fire and took an umbrella and jumped out, you know, and it was one of those things where the umbrella just, whoosh, bam, straight down, hit the ground, he's rolling around, and people are like trying to kick dirt on him and put him out, and I thought, man, that's what I want to do, I want that kind of fun. You know, now the Alanons are kind of looking at me like, oh no, but the, the people that are laughing, you're one of me, you, 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 you know. I'm a mad dog drinker, and, and that's what I was looking for. That's what I thought alcohol could do for me. So um, at a certain point, my dad separated from my mom for a while, and he went and lived in Bermuda, and I was about 13 years old. And at that point, it, was much, it became easier to get, because dad wasn't around, he wasn't resupplying the liquor cabinet. So it was easier for me to get other substances. Um, the first time I got arrested for dealing, I was 13, twice when I was 14, twice when I was 15. Um, but when I was 15, my older brother turned 18, and we lived in the state of New Jersey. And up until 9-11, the state of New Jersey, they didn't have pictures on their driver's licenses. And from that standpoint, uh, when, on his 18th birthday, I snuck into his room and stole his license out of his wallet. Because I know the first name, I know the last name, I know how to spell it, I know the address. <laughs> You're not going to trip me up on the birth date. And I was off to the races. And I, at, by that point, my dad had come into, re into recovery. And so if you wanted to hang out with my father, you either had to go to work with him or you had to go to A with him because that's literally all he did was he'd come home and he'd go to an A meeting, sometimes two, three a day. And one of my favorite things in the world to do was to get really hammered and go to an A meeting with my dad <laughs> because it was the same people that were in the bar. And, they, you know, and they loved me at that point. You know, in the bar, they would tell you all these wild yarns and all that stuff, but they were really only focused on their drinking. As long as you didn't get in between them and their drinking, they were social. But in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, they actually paid attention to you, and they'd talk with you, and they, they you know, and it, once again, it was that sense of, of belonging where there was unconditional love. And uh, it was a wonderful thing, and I thought, you know, if, if I go that bad and, and be like my father, then I'll come into Alcoholics Anonymous and hang out with these guys, because they're my peeps. They're the people that I see in the bars. And my favorite drinking hole became the place that my father used to drink at. I'd go in there and everybody knew me and because and, my mother, towards the end of, of my dad's drinking, if he was home, she wouldn't let him out of the house by himself. You know, if he wanted to go down to the hardware store for a part for the tractor, she knew that, that could be six, seven hours, you know, for him to go down and pick up parts. So she'd always send one of the kids and she'd go, okay, who wants to go with your father? You know, man, my hand would go up because that meant unlimited supply of Shirley Temples, you know, and I'd go, so I'd go down and hang out at the bar with him and, and the hope was that by having a kid with him, that when it was dinner time, he'd at least come home because he knew he had this responsibility. What she didn't understand was I loved beer nuts on the bar, and I was a master at that, that pool game with the sawdust. You, you know, I, it was excellent, especially because the people that I would be playing against, we'd always play for money, and they were drunk. You know, and I was drinking Shirley Temples. So it was, it was a wonderful place for me. And um, then when I started drinking in those exact same bars, this time I'm drinking. And... I wasn't willing to spend money on, on, on the, the bowling anymore because now I needed that money to drink and my, my priorities changed and I went off to college and my drinking got really bad in college. Uh, I, got, um, I got to a school where I knew that if I wanted to get to, get to college, I, you know, I was all D's and F's and if I wanted to get to college I had to get away from my dad and so I literally took a map and I put a pin and I put a 2,000 mile circle and said okay what's outside of 2,000 miles? I'm probably far enough away from my dad because, you know, he knew all my tricks. Now he's sober and, you know, he became this guy that would always bust me and I couldn't figure it out. You know, I'd go out and no matter how quiet I'd sneak in the door, if he'd be sitting in the other end of the house, I'd hear, David? <laughs> no. You know, you're trying to do that sober walk down the hallway and you're kind of ricocheting off the walls and you're reaching for the next thing and it, it's in the shadows. 
and I'd come just into the door just enough so he could see that I was standing there and I'd say, hey dad, how you doing? And he'd ask you some question, how'd you go, how'd, how'd it go tonight, where have you been? And then usually the third question was, you've been drinking, haven't you? Oh man, no. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I was probably 10 or 15 years sober when it finally hit me. He knew that if I was out, I had been drinking. I, I couldn't figure out how did he know. I thought he had like this crystal ball, you know, that he could all, I, I mean, I, no matter what kind of gum I used, mouthwash, didn't matter. He'd always peg me. Um, so I get to college and one of the things that had built up inside of me was anger. And I was kind of the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Sometimes I was a jovial drunk and other times I was violent. You know, and when you're my size, uh, when you turn violent, that's not a pretty thing. And it didn't matter whether I was dealing with people that were friends of mine or not. You know, if I was in a bar and you bumped into me and spilt my drink, fight's on. You know, and I literally, I'm ashamed to say it, but I put some of my friends in the hospital because of stupid things like that where uh, they would actually spill my drink. That was much more important to me when I was in one of those angry phases. And it, it, it got very ugly very quickly. And... Uh, I became a bar fighter and I, I loved the adrenaline dump of a bar fight and the physicality of it and um, thank God I didn't kill anybody and uh, usually I prevailed, sometimes I didn't and you know and then there was always worth great stories afterwards you know um, and before I knew it college was over you know I was a freshman, I had finished my freshman year and started my sophomore year and my father made a huge mistake, he put some money in a bank account for my next semester's tuition and as soon as he put that money in there, I transferred it out and put it over my own account and said, don't call me, I'll call you. And I proceeded to, to start drinking and I drank consistently from that day until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a daily drunk and uh, uh, it was very, very ugly. Um, I drank my way out of college so I didn't have a place to live and I did things like sleep on the floor, the closet of my one of my good friends at college. You know, his roommate didn't like me but he'd once the roommate would go to bed, I'd sneak in there and I'd move all of his shoes out and I'd, I'd lay down on the floor and I'd close the, cl the closet door. And, but even that got to be a problem because every once in a while I'd get up in the middle of the night and I'd think I was at the urinal and I was at somebody else's closet, you know, and I'd think it was funny, but they didn't think it was funny when they wake up and you peed all over their shoes, you know. It, so it got very dysfunctional. And then I, at, a, at, a, at a certain point, I was out on the street. And, and eating out of garbage cans and trying to figure out what you're going to do. And it crescendoed in a, four fights in one night. And uh, I didn't do too well in the last fight because I didn't know I was in it. And uh, yeah, it was pretty ugly. And guy tapped me on the shoulder. I'd beaten up the three roommates and there was four guys to a quad. And this big guy came home and his three roommates were in the hospital. And so he found me and tapped me on the shoulder and gave me a left hook. And I went down a set of staircases and it's a long drawn out story, but we all have them. And um, when I came out of the coma, they, uh, I, I called the person that I swore that I would never talk to again, which was my father. And I learned my first lesson about Alcoholics Anonymous and service. Because my dad, while I was going to that end out there in, in Prescott, Arizona, my dad had flown out to Prescott um, for my birthday because my twin sister and I were born on my dad's birthday. We shared the same birthday. And uh, he and my mom had come out to celebrate with me. And I was too busy drinking, and I said, you know, I didn't invite you, I got plans. So uh, from that day till I came in, uh, it was just a huge drunk. And my dad went to some AA meetings and he said, guys, we're gonna need either pallbearers or somebody to 12-step my kid, I don't know which. And so I made the call from, from the ICU, and within a matter of, of hours, members of Alcoholics Anonymous were in, in the ICU with me. And they helped, helped me until I could get out of there. They got put me on an airplane, flew me back home, and. I crushed my face in that, that last fight, and so they casted my entire head. So when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was truly anonymous, because <laughs> all you knew was my name was Dave and I had blue eyes. That was it. And it was also the source of my first resentment, because after you know, maybe four or six weeks, they took the cast off, and I'd come walk into an AA meeting, and everybody be like, oh, there's a new guy. And they'd come up to me, and I'd be like, hey, it's me. You know, It's me. <laughs> and they, they'd figure it out. Um, but another resentment started because I didn't have any autonomy. Everybody knew me as Don's son, you know, so I started going to different meetings in a different town, and, and my older brother had come into sobriety a couple months before I did. He had crashed and burned, and so the two of us became like peas in a pod. 
we did everything together. We traveled together, we went to meetings, and we did what we learned from my dad. We'd get up in the morning and we'd go to a morning meeting and then we'd go to a noon meeting. And back then we had eaten meetings where you had sandwich meats and stuff and the, the Bowery bombers would come out from under the bridge and they'd actually take money out of the basket to go buy a bottle and, you know, and you could smoke back then in the meetings. And, uh, and then, we'd, of course, we'd, we'd cool our heels, we'd go to the arcade for a couple hours, and then we'd have an evening meeting, and then we'd come home and then eat dinner, and then we'd go back out to a nighttime meeting. So sometimes four meetings a day. Most days were four, four meetings a day. And uh, one day this guy came walking up to us and said, you guys have a job? No. And he says, well, you do now. And he said, I'll be by your house, and I'll pick you up in the, tomorrow morning. And uh, it was uh, my first sponsor, Carl. And he took my brother and I on, a, on his crew. And what I didn't know is everybody on the masonry crew was in, in sobriety. The whole, so all day long, it was like being at an AA meeting. And so he'd pick us up. He'd, he'd drive us to the job site. We'd work all day. Uh, we'd have a meeting at lunchtime, sitting around. And he'd drive us home, and he'd say, get, take a shower, get something to eat, and I'll be back in an hour, and we're going to go to a meeting. And that was the routine. You know, he, we had meetings every day, all day, all day long, and it was a wonderful way to get sober. Um, Carl was uh, an old timer in those days, in my mind. I mean, I think he had about 10 years of sobriety at the time. And, and to me, it was like, you know, I could believe that somebody had 30 days, maybe 60 days, but anybody with a year or more, they're, they're liars. You can't, you can't stay sober that long. And here's this guy with 10 years. And, and he convinced me that, no, he really did have, have double-digit sobriety. And so I started to trust him after a while, you know, and um, my problem was I didn't really work the steps initially when I first got here because the pain started to wear off. And one of the things Carl taught me was <clears throat> you, this deal is about a relationship with a power greater than yourself. And that's a problem if you don't believe in a power greater than yourself. I didn't trust the power greater than myself. I didn't know anything about it, and it scared me. Um, and so one day I went to an A meeting, and th there was this, it was everybody was talking about God, and if you mentioned God more than three or four times in a meeting, I'd get up and I'd go outside and smoke a cigarette. And so I was complaining to my brother, and we were walking together, and I, I said, you don't believe this God crap, do you? And he stopped, and he squared off to me, which he didn't normally do. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, yeah, I believe in God. And you could have pushed me over with a feather. Here's my flesh and blood, somebody that I, that I trust with my life, tells me he believes in God. I thought, wow, that's really crazy. And a couple days later... You know, it's cold, it's, it's, you know, in the wintertime, and Carl picks me up, and we're driving to a job site, and it's one of those early mornings where the, <clears throat> the sun's coming up over the mountains, and, and the water, the steam is coming off the river, the Black River, and Carl cranks the window down. I'm like, Carl, what are you doing? You crazy? Put the window up. And he's waving his hand out the window. He's just waving. I said, what the hell are you doing? Have you lost your mind? He says, I'm waving to God. Uh, and I thought, wow, here's the second person that I trust, and he believes in God. And... Now the door had cracked open, just like it says in the 12 by 12. I started to think that maybe there's something here, but it was still really scary. And then one of the amazing things happened was my brother looked at me and says, hey, man, I'm working the steps with Carl, and, and I'm, I'm going to go do my fifth step. And not to say that alcoholics are competitive, but I said, oh, really? You're going to go do your fifth step? With who? And he says, oh, with Leo. And I said, oh, fifth step, okay, great. So when are you going to go do that? He says, I got an appointment in about six or seven days. So I immediately made a beeline to the meeting where I knew I'd find Leo. And I said, Leo, hey, man, I want to do a fifth step with you. Can I, I wasn't going to let him beat me to anything. You know, so he tells me where the, where the meeting is and uh, where I'm going to hook up with him. He lives next to the, to the church in town. And I said, okay, that's cool. And I, I go up there and I drive up there. Now, I haven't done any step work at all. You know, I've, I've read part of the big book, but I really couldn't read real well because I didn't do real well in school. So... I show up at, at Leo's and he rings the doorbell and he opens up the door and he's wearing a collar. And I looked at him, it's God is my witness, and I said, where are you going, a costume party? And he said, no, I'm a Catholic priest. <laughs> that was terrifying to me. I mean, I was in, was talk about shock and awe. I didn't know what to say. I'm standing uh, 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 babbling like an idiot. And he's like, oh, come on in. And he handed me an ashtray and he says, yeah, you want to smoke a cigarette? And I thought, wow, I thought these guys were uptight and he's, he's going to let me smoke. And so he was very kind to me. And I, I kind of told him sort of a life story, you know, and, and of course I embellished a little bit and, you know, he gets done with that and he says, you know, that's really good. Who's your sponsor? And I said, well, Carl's my sponsor. And he's like, well, maybe you should talk to Carl and do a little work out of the book. 
and then come back and see me. And I said, oh, okay, I can do that. And so I went to Carl and I said, Carl, um, what do I got to do to start the steps? And of course, he started me on step one. And I didn't bother to tell him that I had an appointment in a week with Leo again to do my fifth step. So a week shows up and I'm sitting out in the car with an envelope and I write some things on the back of an envelope because he said it had to be written. So I got, okay, I got to be written. Now, I didn't bother to pick up the book and read the book to figure out what it said in the book. Uh, it wasn't until my third inventory that I actually did an inventory like it was done out of the book where Carl showed me how to go through the inventory process. And the reason I tell that story is because if there's a way to do the steps wrong, I've done it. But I'm still sober. You know, by God's grace and good sponsorship, I got sober on December 5th, 1981. I was a 19-year-old kid, and I'm still sober today. I am living proof that you can come to Alcoholics Anonymous and stay sober. This keep coming back, how about stay? Let's get a sponsor, let's give them a big book, and let's show them through this program so they don't have to keep going back out and banging their heads. Because I, I sit there and I watch that and I go, what is going on with this deal? You know, why are is so many people relapsing? And it's because they're not given the gift that I was given when I got here. And thank God for those crusty old timers. You know, phenomenal. Uh, you know, of course, I was a teenage. I was a walking hormone when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll never forget it. Uh, Jim McCabe, this, this fat old guy who walked with a cane, he, he pulled me aside one day and he says, hey, I saw you looking at the girls. And I said, oh, yeah, man, I'm, she is so hot. And he, and he said, you know, you don't even look at those girls. He says, I know I'm an old fat old man. He says, but I'll grab some of these young bucks and we'll kick the crap out of you. You stay away from the women in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I did what any logical teenager would do. I went to a different meeting. <laughs> you know? But they patrolled Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you, got, if you got out of line, they gently, lovingly corrected you. You know, they'd tell you, sit down, shut up, don't spread your disease around here, you know? Those kind of things. But they did it with love. And you knew that they had your best interest at heart. And that's the kind of AA I was raised on. It was a wonderful way to get sober. And so the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous happened. I worked the steps and I had a spiritual awakening. My spirit, spirit woke up. You know? And that's the cool thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. If you read the 12th step, it says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Not a result, one result. We do this whole thing so that our spirits wake up. I was given that gift. What a wonderful way to start your life as a young person. And I started digging ditches for a living and going to college at, at night and started down the path to get, get my life back in order and all the blessings started to come true for me. And since I was five years old, I wanted to be just like my dad uh, and fly airplanes. And so uh, I got into the, to the military and I, I, after I finished college, I uh, managed to get into the military and they said, you know, have you, have you been clean and sober? And I said, sure, absolutely, I've been clean and sober. And to my amazement, they said, I told the truth. And they said, sure, come on in, we'll take you. And I was like, wow, this is weird. You know, and, and from college, you know, I, Beverly was talking about meeting people. I, I, I'm, I'm unloading my car at college and I'm a senior and I know every, it's a small college, it's like 1,200 kids. It's like being in high school. I knew every girl on campus. And here I see these two girls walking across the parking lot as I'm getting back from summer, summer break. And the thought that goes through my, my mind is, oh, fresh meat. They gotta be freshmen, right? And as I get closer, the one girl looks at me and she smiled at me. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. And I carried that box upstairs, walked in my room, and I looked at my roommate and I said, hey, Fritz, I just saw the girl I'm gonna, gonna, gonna get married to. And he said, you're crazy, you know? Well, in three days, we'll be selling, celebrating 24 years of marriage. And she's sitting right over there. <clears throat> Another miracle. You know, how does that work? I mean, I was an emotionally stunted, self-absorbed, you know, alcoholic who'd had a spiritual awakening, but now I'm starting to fill my life up with good things, the things that life gives you. And I'm stopping doing the things that I was taught to do. You know, I would still do some 12-step work, but I got, I'm busy, I got class, and I gotta go get a job, and now I'm flying airplanes, and I'm in the military, and my life is filling up with all this good stuff, and so I'm knocking off the, the things that Carl had taught me how to do early in sobriety. And uh, the years are clicking away, and I got to about the 10-year point, and I'd stopped using the big book altogether. And it was much easier using the 12 by 12, because if somebody wanted me to help them with the steps, I could look at them and say, you know, here's a 12 and 12, they can find step one in 12 and 12 because it says step one. If you don't know where the step one is in the big book, it's kind of hard to find it. And 
uh, I, I stopped doing the things that I was given, the gift that I had been given, and I was shortchanging people. And um, I had 10 or 11 years of sobriety, and one day I'm cleaning my service weapon for the military, and I know there's a round in the chamber, and I didn't even have the guts to pull the trigger. And I realized at that point, something's wrong. And what had happened was a couple years before that, my sponsor, Carl, left. Um, I was working with him right up to the day he left, and one day, no phone call. I said, well, where are we going to work on Monday? He's like, I'll give you a call. Monday came, no call. Tuesday, no call. Wednesday, I go over by Carl's house. His house is empty. I mean, he's literally left. So I track him down and find out where he is, and he's about 50 miles away from there. He'd moved up into the mountains, and I said, Carl, what's going on? And he says, well, I know you, and you're loyal, and you've got places to go, and you've got things in life. He goes, but I'm moving up here. And I said, why are you moving up here? He says, because I'm sick and tired of what AA has become down, down below, as he called it. It wasn't the same program he got sober on. He moved up to the mountains. He says, you know, I know I've got God in my life. I don't need to go to meetings. I'll do 12-step work. I'll still work with drunks. He says, but I'm done with Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, you need to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't understand what he was talking about. But for him, AA had changed because rehabs had opened up and they started talking about, you know, my, my dog died and, you know, my car's broken down. They weren't talking about how to work the 12 steps. They weren't talking about God. They weren't talking about spirituality. And that's what he needed from those meetings. He needed to work with newcomers and carry the message, a spiritual message. I wasn't figuring that out. I was looking at it from, well, how could he do that to me? Why did he move away on me? So I got another sponsor and he had died. All right, so you get, get, you're going to go get yourself another sponsor. Well, I got a, a friend of mine, a guy that was in the program, and we kind of did that sick co-sponsor thing, and his name was also Dave, and it was sort of a, one of those agreements where if you don't call me on my stuff, I won't call you on your stuff. It, it works great for a while, but, you know, you can, when your wife challenges, you can say, no, no, I've talked to my sponsor about it. <laughs> you know, it's enough to back her off, but it, it, I got really, really sick, and as I said, I got to the point where I almost blew my head off. Um, God's got a sense of humor because right after that, I was flying, a, I'd gotten hired by an airline and I was flying over in Europe and I was an instructor. And as an instructor, you're teaching people and needless to say, my ego was rebuilding slowly but surely. And uh, I was flying with this guy and, and uh, I could do no wrong in my eyes. And at a certain point, he looked at me and said, you know, I can't even work with you. Sit down and shut up. And right after that, he started making a mistake. And because of my arrogance and the position that I had put into that crew, I couldn't bring it to his attention because I tried to bring it to his attention. I said, hey, well, guys, we're making a mistake. And he said, I told you to shut up. And we nearly flew into the side of the Alps with several hundred people on board the airplane. And I saw it coming. And I couldn't do anything about it. Strictly because of my ego in the position that my actions had put us into, following down those lines. And that led to a whole series of investigations with the FAA, and it was a nightmare. And it was one of those things where I fell back onto what I knew in the program. It doesn't matter what happens, you tell the truth. And, you know, in that situation, the union wanted me to lie, and the FAA's breathing down my neck, and I realized, you know, my whole life I've wanted to fly airplanes, and God gave that to me, and now it looks like it's going to get taken away. And I could hear Carl's voice in my head, turn it over to God and tell the truth. And long story short, when the dust settled, the captain lied, the first officer lied, everybody else was lying. And they figured out what had happened. And they fired everybody except me because I told the truth. But that's a tribute to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's nothing for me. Because when I landed at Kennedy Airport, every single exit I had to ask God, please help me not get drunk. I so desperately wanted a drink. For the first time in my life, I drove to an AA meeting in my uniform. Nobody knew what I did for a living. And I sat in an AA meeting and in my home group and I cried. And they just loved me. It was like being back in kindergarten again, sitting in that principal's office with that woman doing the many aggress. It was unconditional love. That's what I needed. And God's got a sense of humor, because four days later, after the hearing and I realized I have my job, I get a phone call, the phone call you never want. 
I'm in the reserves. I'm thinking, Air Force Reserves, they're never going to activate me. And sure enough, they activated me, <laughs> you know? And I looked, had to look at my wife and say, honey, I'm going off to war. Here's the bills. Don't know when I'll see you. And off I went. And it was one of those situations where, you know, I'm shaky at best in recovery now. I've got double digit sobriety, but I still don't have a solid sponsor. I haven't gotten back into the book. My prayer and meditation life is like Swiss cheese, and I'm hanging by a thread. But I had been taught the basics. And we were descending into a, a combat zone, and, and the report we got was it was going to be under chemical attack. And everybody's freaking out because once a year in the reserves, you put on your chemical gear, you know, and you have this little checklist and you follow along. And when you're flying to put on chem gear in a cockpit, it, it takes a while. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes to put it all in all correctly. You know, and it, the last time you might have done it was a year ago. And now you're going into this thing, situation and everybody's freaking out like, how are we going to do this? And I don't know what came over me, but I still, in my helmet bag, I carried a big book and a 12 and 12, because that's what Carl had taught me, was you carry literature with you. Same reason I have a big book with me up here at the podium. You carry the book with you. And I reached into that book, and I picked it up out of my helmet bag, and it fell open <laughs> to the third step prayer. And I returned my will and my life over to care of God right there on the spot. And I said, okay, God, if today's the day I die, today's the day I die. But from this point forward, I'm working for you. And I meant it. Now, I still put on the chem gear. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> and as it turned out, it was a good thing that, you know, they were firing scuds, but they weren't chemical scuds. And I managed to get through that. But I, that was a turning point in my sobriety. Because from that point forward, I knew that I had hurt a lot of people. All the guys that I'd taken through the work with the 12 and 12, I hadn't given them the gift that had been given to me. So I made a point of saying, okay, I'm going to take you through the work like it was taught to me. If you would do, I wrote another inventory. I got a new sponsor. I said, let me make amends to you. Let me show you what the gift really should have been that I should have given you. And so I took them through the work one by one. And each time I take them through, they're like, wow, that's great. Would you take me and my sponsee through? Because I don't know how to do this. You've only seen it once. Let's do this together. And so the next thing you know, I'm taking through guys in pairs and three and five. And next thing you know, they're saying, hey, why don't you do a workshop? And, you know, and then I'm taking through 20 people and then 50 people. And, and it, it just kind of mushroomed. And it was one of those deals. And that's actually how I met Glenn. Because one day Glenn's there, he's taping. And, and the neat thing about those CDs, when you do a workshop, is they go around the world. And you start getting, you meet people from all over the place. And I was able to carry the message the way that I had been taught to carry the message. You know, get somebody through the steps, get them free of the bondage, get them a spiritual awakening fast so they can move forward. And uh, it was wonderful. And I did this workshop, I think it was in 2000, maybe it was 2001. And, and one day I get a phone call and there's a guy on the other end of the phone. And he says, uh, you know, I always use my, my full name. And people know that I'm a pilot. And there was this guy in Chicago. Once a year, the, the seniority list comes out. And in my company, and at that time, there was 12,500 pilots. And this guy had gone through all these names looking for a D. Fredrickson. Now, it's not alphabetical. It's, you get a number when you get hired, and it's by the number. So he searched until he found a D. Fredrickson, and he called me up. And he says, is this Dave Fredrickson? I said, yeah, it is. And he says, are you the guy I'm listening to on CD? And I said, probably. And we struck up a friendship, you know. You know, it was a fantastic deal. And so I carried the message to this guy. And... My life is getting good, and we're having kids, and it's just really filling up. And my wife looks at me one day, and she says, you know, we've outgrown our house. And we lived in this little house in Green Village, New Jersey. And she says, can't we move? And I said, sure, let's move to Pennsylvania. I can't afford anything in Jersey, so we'll move to Pennsylvania. And the internet was just starting to get big, and my wife wasn't really computer savvy. And I said, why don't you just find us a house in Pennsylvania? She said, I'm not driving to Pennsylvania. Are you crazy? I said, well, just look it up on the internet. You know, they're starting to put that stuff on the internet. And, and she's like, how do you do that? So I showed her, and she's like, well, why can't we move to Chicago? I said, it's too cold. Why not Miami? Well, it's, it's hot and sticky. You know, she goes, why not Dallas? And I said, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm the smart alcoholic, right? I'm thinking if I shoot down every domicile that we have, because I tell her that I want to stay in New York, I'm going to lose this argument. So I have to throw her a bone. I said, well... I might consider Dallas on an outside chance, but there's only one town I'll consider it. It's a little town called Flower Mound, Texas, because there's a bunch of pilots there I, that I know. I've got a bunch of buddies that live there. And big mistake to tell him Alan on that. So she goes and finds the only builder that I've ever heard of that builds in Pennsylvania and Flower Mound, Texas. 
So I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? So I do the natural thing that an alcoholic will do, a lie of omission. So I pick up the phone, I call Myers, uh, my buddy Myers, Ray I call him up and say, Myers, I need a realtor in Flower Mound, Texas. You know anybody in the program down there? And he says, yeah. And he gives me a phone number. And so I call this woman up and I said, listen, Jan, I have absolutely no, absolutely no interest in buying a house. I'm just trying to get my wife off my back. So I want to come down there, and if you're willing, I want you to show me so many houses that she's crying by the time we get back to the airport on Sunday. I want four or five houses on Friday, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. I'm going to catch the last flight out. And to my amazement, she says, okay. So we do that. And we're down there, we're looking at houses, and I keep seeing this one sign, and that little voice, still small voice, jumps in my heart. And I deny it all weekend long, because I've got a plan, and it's Dave's plan to not live in Flower Mound, Texas. So we're driving back to the airport, and I said, Jan, stop the car. And she says, what do, you, what do you mean, stop the car? I said, stop the car. I said, take me to that builder, whoever that is. And so she does. And I had done some building in my days, and when I had gotten laid off and, and done some uh, construction and additions and renovations, I mean, you've heard of my company. It was called Fly by Night Construction, because I literally called it that, because I was flying for the reserves at night, and I was building houses and doing additions during the day. And... So I walk into this model house, and I'm like, well, your crown moldings. I'm pointing out everything that's wrong with this house because I don't want to live in Flower Mound, Texas. And so my wife walks in. She goes, oh, I love this house. I want this house. So now I realize, well, we're going to have to put an offer in on this house. So I throw in everything I can think of, ceiling fans in every room and all these changes, and hand it to the guy. He says, well, I'm going to have to talk to the, to the, the big boss and the partner. And so he goes and makes a phone call, and he comes back, and he, he counters me. And I said, well, if that's the case, then I want you to blow the back of the house out seven feet, and I want a three-car garage extra wide, and I want an apartment above the garage. And, I mean, I threw in even more than it was obscene, the things that I threw in there. And he comes back, and he accepted the offer. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> So I said, well, I don't have any money to give you. And he says, well, what do you mean you don't have any money to give me? This is a custom-built house. I said, well, I don't have any money, so I haven't sold my house in New Jersey. And he says to me, well, you got 2500 bucks?" And I said, yeah, I can scrape that together. And he goes, well, give me 2500 bucks." And I said, well, then I, if that's the case, I want a weasel clause. I want to be able to get my 2500 bucks back if I can't sell my house in New Jersey. And he says, well, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you till sheetrock. The moment we start hanging sheetrock on this house, we're going to have to make the deal. Or I'll give you your 2500 bucks back because I'm going to have to customize it for somebody else to sell it. And I said, you got a deal. So I'm flying back to New Jersey with a contract for a house in Flower Mound, Texas. I'm thinking, what the hell have I done? I don't want to live in Flower Mound, Texas, right? And my wife, she's one of those people that if she, if she ever has a dream, be careful, because her dreams always come true. And she comes to me and she says, you know, I'm dreaming these numbers, and it's driving me crazy. And I said, well, what are the numbers? And she tells me, and I'm thinking, okay, and I kind of dismiss it. And I'm not a big watching preachers on TV guy and one day the next day I'm shaving and I'm got this TV on and it, I didn't pick the channel but there's this guy you may have heard of him his name's Joel Osteen he, he's he, at the time he wasn't well known and he's on there and he's doing his talk and he, he's talking about premonitions and how God will speak to you and I'm just kind of sitting there kind of interesting and I said honey rem remind me of those three numbers and she tells me the numbers and sure enough pops up on the screen it's the same numbers as the address for his church and I thought out oh, it's a coincidence disregard that. It can't possibly be. And um, I go off and I'm, I go to work and I get home from work and the phone rings and I pick up the phone and the guy on the end of the phone says, is this Dave Fredrickson? And I said, yeah. He says, is this Dave Fredrickson I'm listening to on CD? And I said, probably. He says, great. I'm in management with your company and this guy Tommy from Chicago gave me a set of your CDs and we want to hire you to come down here and take over the drug and alcohol pil program for pilots at American Airlines. For, for my company. And I said, okay. And he says, but there's one catch. And I said, what's that? You got to live in Texas. <laughs> I said, you're not going to believe this, Mike, but I bought a house three days ago in Flower Mound, Texas, and I didn't know why. I gladly moved to Flower Mound, Texas. It was just the easiest thing in the world. We haven't sold our house. So we put the house on the market, and we're working at it, and we're working at it. And now I want to go to Texas, and I, God's not selling this house. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? And the months are cracking away, and I, I called the builder, and I said, listen, build the whole development. My house is the last house you build. He says, okay, I can do that. And so he calls me one day and says, we're building. And I'm thinking, oh, no. 
And he calls me again, and he says, Sheet Rock's coming on Monday. And I'm like, no, 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 no. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And so I did what I've been taught to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, okay, God, you got a problem. And if you're the God that I think you are, you better fix it. <laughs> you know? The day the Sheet Rock showed up on the job, we got a better than full price offer for that house in New Jersey. That's the kind of God that I have, right? So I take over this program, and... I don't know how to run a program like this, but I start doing what I've been taught to do. I start teaching them the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And all these guys are coming in through rehab. And one of the things about a pilot, when you get diagnosed as, as having an alcohol problem, you lose your medical. And so now, they have, in order to get their medical, they have to jump through all these hoops and go to rehab and after 90 days, and they have to go to aftercare and all these other things. And so I start teaching the drug and alcohol school for the FAA. It's called Hims, and the program's getting bigger and bigger. When I took over the program, we had 53 guys in the program, and it quadrupled in size. And the interesting thing is, all I was teaching was what I'd been taught of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I left that program, we had a 97% recovery rate. That's Alcoholics Anonymous in action. You know? That's Alcoholics Anonymous in action. What a cool, cool deal. In that process, 9-11 happened, you know, and one of the things that happened after 9-11 was they started deputizing pilots, and I decided to volunteer for the program. So I go and I show up, and, and uh, part of that is you have to get a psych evaluation, so I'm sitting there with this guy, and he's, he had to fill an online questionnaire, and so I told the truth again. So he's looking at my evaluation, he says, reading it, and he's going, alcohol, yes, marijuana, yes, cocaine, yes, heroin, yes, and he kind of drops his glasses, and he looks at me, and he goes, you look familiar. And I said, yeah, I gave you your FA drug and alcohol briefing. He goes, that's where I know you from. He goes, sure, I'll give you a gun. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go from being a teenage drug addict, drug dealer, to a federal officer carrying a gun? Only my God can do that, you know? It's just the power of this program, the gifts that you can be given are phenomenal, you know? It opened up all kinds of doors for me, you know, at, and I had these program babies. You know, my wife and I, we had these two beautiful, beautiful kids, and, you know, I didn't have the greatest example in the entire world. M my parents, God love them, they're kind of dysfunctional in their marriage relationship. Today, my dad lives in Monterey, California, and my mom still lives in New Jersey, and they're still married, and it's been that way for 20-plus years. So I kind of knew that that's not the model I wanted to follow in a relationship. And I started talking to people in Alcoholics Anonymous, how do you do this? And, you know, I found out how you can get divorced four, five, six times. Those guys know how to do that. I wasn't getting a whole lot of good feedback. But where I did get some really good feedback on how to have relationships was Al-Anon. And I've been going to Al-Anon for years. And, you know, I mean, how many alcoholics do we have in the room? Yeah. I'm not going to ask you how many Al-Anons are in the room because every hand in this room would go up, right? Because we're all Al-Anons. If you've got a sponsor, if you've got a friend in Alcoholics Anonymous, you qualify for Al-Anon. It's the same 12 steps. But they'll teach you how to work them from just a slightly different a angle. They'll, they'll, they'll teach you the, the power of this program and how to have a healthy relationship and how to set healthy boundaries with a sponsee who wants to call you when you're in at 4.58 in the morning yesterday, or this morning actually, you know, because he doesn't realize you're in Hawaii. And I had to set a healthy boundary. I learned that from Al-Anon. It was a wonderful deal, you know? So I went to, and started thinking about this thing, and I don't know how to have a relationship. The 12 steps work for me, but how do you keep a marriage with kids? You know, now you get something to fight about, serious arguments, it is these little kids, and you care about them, and you love them, and you want to protect them. And I thought, well, the 12 traditions work for Al-Anon. And one day I was listening to a set of tapes, of this crazy Texan lady been Mary Pearl, and she was talking about how she and her husband worked the traditions and relationships. And I thought, this is cool. I'm doing this. Went to my wife, said, hey, let's try this. Fantastic. So now we're working the 12 steps and 12 traditions. And I'm doing a workshop up at the Wilson house, Bill Wilson's house up in Vermont one day, and, and I've been talking about working the 12 steps and 12 traditions, and I put together how to work the 12 concepts. So my family, we run our household on the 12 steps, 12 traditions, and 12 concepts. So if you come over to our house, it won't be too long before you hear 
uh, my, one of my kids. I make a motion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. What's the motion? <laughs> well, I want to do whatever it is. Okay, do I have a second? We got to get a second. We get a second. We vote. Oh, we have a we have a minority opinion. The minority opinion usually it's me. The minority opinion gets to speak their piece, you know, and then we take a vote again. And usually I get outvoted, and we go do whatever that is what they wanted, you know. It's wonderful. I mean, my wife's in charge of the finance committee. She doesn't have to ask me, you know, geez, we have, in, we have this much money over here. Can I move it to this account? That's part of, she has the right of decision. She has the right of participation, just like our concepts teach. As long as she stays within the standard rules and guidelines, she can go do whatever she wants with it. It's the way it works. It's a wonderful way to live because I'm not calling the shots. And it keeps me humble and not the big shotism. You know, because one of the greatest threats to my recovery is what I experienced at around 10, 11 years, where your ego will rebuild. And if you've never read our history books, A.A. Comes of Age, there's some fantastic mandatory reading from my sponsees in the back of A.A. Comes of Age from a guy by the name of Harry Tebow. And he wrote a series of articles and essays on the resurgence of the alcoholic ego and the threat it is to your sobriety. Absolutely mandatory reading from my guys. So. My family's running well, my life is running well, everything's great. About a year and a half ago, I'm over in London on my anniversary, December 5th, right? And I'm gonna go to an AA meeting. So I fly in all night, I land in London, and I go to the hotel, I change into my clothes, find out where the meeting is, and I'm walking. It was one of those days where it had been snowing like crazy in London, which is kind of unusual. They get snow and a couple hours later it melts and it's gone. And uh, they'd gotten about six inches of snow and it had started to melt and the sun had come out through the broken overcast and I'm looking at this church spire, and it was one of those days where the sun had been out long enough that it had melted the snow anywhere the sun could hit it. So the church spire was half snow and half dry. And there was this beam of light coming out of the clouds. It was spectacularly beautiful. And I'm praying, and I'm looking up there, and I'm thanking God for my life and my sobriety. And I swing around the corner to where the sun hadn't hit the ground, and there was black ice. And my leg went out from me and behind me, and I fell. And like an idiot, after years of martial arts, instead of trying to do the judo fall, I tried to catch myself. And I heard one of those sounds that you never want to hear. <coughs> you kind of look over your shoulder and I hope that wasn't me and there's nobody else around. So I climb up on the stone wall and I sit there for a while and I'm okay and I'm, I'm doing the old man shuffle. I'm just barely walking and I'm, if I can just get back to the hotel, grab a couple Tylenol. Well, if Tylenol's good, but what if it's not muscles? What if, let me get a couple Advil, you know, if one's good, two's better, four has got to be the best. Handful of that stuff, go to bed, wake up the next morning, and I can actually function as long as I just kind of walk like a robot. And I go to the captain, I said, hey, I hurt my back yesterday. It's your leg, your trip, just get me home. So we fly home, I go into my, my chief pilot, and I said, hey, I hurt myself over in London, I'm going to have to call in sick. And of course, he says the magic words. Well, really? Well, we're out of pilots. If you call in sick, we're going to have to cancel the next trip. And that's going to be like 400 people because we're going to have to cancel that inbound leg and the outbound leg. Can you just do that one favor and just fly one more trip before you call in sick? So all these years in recovery, like an idiot, I said, I'll take one for the team. All right. But when I get back from this trip, I'm calling in sick. No problem. So I call in, I fly the trip, I get back, and I, now I can hardly walk. I get home to Texas, go through the process, and I realize once they do the x-rays, they find out that I broke my back. Well, I got hurt on the job, so that means workman's comp. So they start to argue and fight with you, and, and it took about six months in that condition before workers' comp, I finally forced them into a position where they would pay. And I knew that if you did anything outside of workers' comp, they'd immediately drop you. They'd get no insurance, no money, no nothing. So. I got, now I have some titanium pins and braces and all kinds of stuff, and I'm a, kind of a walking, you know, $6 million man. And the problem was the nerve was stuck between the bones, and it was getting ground that entire time. So I have some severe nerve damage. So in one foul swoop, I lost my health. I lost my career. I lost my finances. And this past year, I lost my retirement when my company went bankrupt. If I wasn't working the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd be in a world of hurt. But today I have a powerful God. The same kind of God that can take a drug dealer and get him to that career, he's got a plan for me going forward. And when all the hell is breaking loose and all the chaos, I go back and I spend time with God. And he shows me which way to go. I mean, I now have more time than I've had in a long time. you know. And so 
I have a time to work with newcomers and, and 12 step and, and carry the message and, and working for the Civil Air Patrol and my kids are interested in Civil Air Patrol. So now I'm, and they find out you're military, retired military, they're like, oh, now I'm the safety officer for the squadron and, and uh, the American Legion and all these great, wonderful things, which I never would have had time because my job is still in New York. So I was commuting from Dallas to New York to go fly trips. You know, pretty, pretty interesting commute. But now I have time to be home. And one of the things that I've learned is every six months, I'm kind of one of those 12 12 guys that I, I do annual, annual inventory, annual semi-annual inventory. So every January, every June, I write, I, I grab a new guy, and we start at step one, and we go to step 12, formally, through the inventory process. Because I never want to get to that point where spiritual plaque builds up and I'm thinking about blowing my head off again, right? So I do a really good 10 and 11, but it amazes me every time I sit down with a pen and paper and I start to write again and I'm thinking there's not going to be anything that comes up, sure enough, stuff floats to the surface. Even stuff that's years old. I'm a blackout drinker. Every once in a while something will float up and I'm thinking, how could you have missed that and all the inventory work you've done and here it is, something new that's on your inventory that you've got to go make amends for and clean up. And so this year, this past year, I wrote the inventory. And one of the things that I do is, you know, there's the resentment inventory, then there's the fear inventory, there's the sex inventory. A lot of people miss the part that's only mentioned like nine times in the book about a sex ideal. Well, I have written an ideal. It's not just what I want out of a relationship. More importantly, it's what I want to bring to a relationship. And so I had written this inventory and I had this new ideal. And one of the things that I did was I brought the ideal to my wife. And I said, honey, review this and tell me how I'm doing. And I'm thinking, she's going to say, oh, this is great. Not a problem. You're doing, you're awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> what came out of her mouth was, you've hurt me more in the past year than in your entire time I've known you. That's tough to take. So I went to my sponsor and my spiritual advisor and said, what do I do with this? And what she was really saying was, now that you're home, I mean, that's a shock to your system. My whole ego, if you'd ask me, what do you tell me about yourself, Dave? In the first five things I would have told you, I'm a pilot. Because my ego had identified with that. I'm no longer a pilot. And I was kind of lost. And so I was throwing myself into service. And I was an AA angel, but I was an at-home devil. I mean, I wasn't there. I was spending much more time doing service work than loving on her and loving my family. And I was neglecting her, you know? This is 28 years sober I'm doing this behavior. So I threw myself into my relationship and I started studying how to have a relationship. I read every book I can get my hands on, tapes, CDs, videos, trying to be a better husband. I think I'm succeeding. But she's going to have to answer that question, not me. You know, I go to my kids now, and I do the same thing. The same way that I use that as a report card, the ideal for her, I go to my kids and say, how am I doing as your dad? You tell me. You know, the first couple times you do it, they don't want to hurt your feelings, they won't tell you. Once they get used to it, trust me, they will tell you. <clears throat> That's advanced AA. Why can I treat you people better than I can treat my own family? What's up with that? It's wrong. I don't want to be that man. You know, the longer I'm sober, the narrower the road gets. I used to be able to sit in my crap for hours, months, weeks, because that's what I knew. It was my crap. You know, I used to make this analogy. It's like sitting in a cesspool, right? And the water level's right up just below your nostrils. But it's your crap. And it's warm, and it's, you know it. You know the sense. You know the smell. You just want people to stop making waves, you know? <laughs> If I fall in the cesspool today, if I get off the spiritual beam within a couple of hours, I'm in agony. I cannot stand to live that life anymore. Thank God I can't stand to be that man anymore. So I worked the hell out of this program. You know, and, and, and I started to take the steps from a little bit different direction because the longer I'm sober, the more I realize I've made some mistakes along the way. When I first got here, like all of us, I thought step one was about alcohol. It's not about alcohol, guys. Step one is, has alcohol in it, so I was focused on alcohol. Well, I'm 20 some odd years sober at the time. I'm not drinking, therefore it must be okay, right? No, my wife is looking at me saying, something is seriously wrong in your life. Our book says alcohol is but a symptom. So if it's not about alcohol, what's it about? It's about unmanageability. 
It's the other end of the step. I had missed that. She was screaming at me emotionally saying, you're unmanageable. You're not meeting, you're not filling my love tank. Could you please fill my love tank? I was blown away. Step two, I thought, was about God and, and me turning my will over to God. I missed the mark there. The book talks about how if God is everything or God is nothing, what is your choice to be? The second step proposition. If God is everything, we have to give him everything. I just wanted to give him my addiction. I'll take care of the finances. I'll take care of the retirement. I'll take care of the relationship with my wife and my kids. You just handle the addiction of God and everything will be fine. That's not the deal. The deal is Texas No Limit Hold'em. We go all in. At least I do. God is everything in my life, in every area of my life. You know, In step three, I missed the mark in step three. I thought that step three was about turning my will and my life over to God. It's not. How did I miss that? It's about a decision about a relationship with God. I'm supposed to make a decision about letting God be my director. What does a director do? He tells you what to do. So today I let God tell me what I'm supposed to be doing, right? He's the principal, I'm the agent. I'm supposed to be his representative here. He's my source of power. He is the father and I am his child. That was tough for me. I didn't have a good father-son relationship. And I'm supposed to be thinking about my power greater than myself and having a father-son relationship? wasn't working for me because I was identifying with my earthly father, not the God of my understanding. So when I changed that attitude, things started to change. I thought my fourth step was about resentment because it talks about, it's the only thing in our book that talks about three times. You ever notice that? There's three different places it talks about resentment. You know, there's the resentment from the standard inventory, and it talks about resentment back on, eight, on 84, about we watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And then back on 119, it talks about resentment again, for when resentful thoughts come to us, it's the, it's the gratitude list, we count our blessings. Why is that? Because when I'm resentful, I have no forgiveness in my heart. And I figured out that the fourth step is about forgiveness. You know, and when I was doing a talk recently, I started looking up the word forgiveness, and one of the things that popped up was a wonderful Hawaiian word, which I don't speak Hawaiian, didn't know anything about it, but I wrote it down. It's ho o pono pono. It's the it's the Hawaiian in essence. It's how they make amends in Hawaiian, and it's all it starts out with prayer, then silence, then confession, discussion, restitution, repentance and forgiveness. Does that remind you of anything? I was blown away. For me, the fourth step now is all about forgiveness. And there's that wonderful prayer between column three and column four that we're supposed to have forgiveness. I had missed it. I now focus on that instead of the chaos that's in my life. All the way through, five, six, and seven. I run into people all the time in Alcoholics Anonymous that they'll tell you that I'm sitting on six and seven. It's two questions and a prayer for six. And step seven is a prayer. I give my guys 15 minutes. You know, if you answer the two questions right, you don't need to say the prayer. And for six, and seven is a prayer. 15 minutes, we're moving on. Boom. Eight and nine. I, I take a new wet drunk off the streets, like Carl taught me. From the start till he's out making amends takes me about six hours. Right? My job is to get them the emotional baggage off their back so they can go out and help make their amends and teach them to rely on a power greater than themselves. The second time through, we go through page by page, and I teach them the 12 steps, and then I get them a sponsee. Most of my guys have a sponsee. By the time they got six months, they better have a sponsee so they can be teaching it, because the way we learn it is see one, do one, teach one. That's the important deal. And then they're out having their own experience on God. And I'm, at that point, I can step back and just kind of watch. They come to me with questions. I don't have to tell them how to live their life. I just have to answer a few questions. And usually my questions are responded with a question. They ask me a question, I just ask them a question back. What do you think God wants? My guys know if they come to me with a problem, the first thing out of my mouth is, have you talked to God about it? And their answer better be yes, or they're going to hear the dial tone. Okay, click, ding. That's the way we roll. You know, it's all about a relationship with a power greater than ourselves. If your God is like my God, he's your best friend. You carry him with you everywhere. You know, in the morning, if you're getting up in the morning like I did for so many years and you're thinking, oh, I've got to say my prayers, you've missed the mark. If you're getting up in the morning, it's like, wow, I get to go spend some time with God, my best friend. That's how you're, at least how my relationship is. And that's one of the ways I know when I'm off the beam. If I'm getting up in the morning going, oh, 
I've got to say my prayers. I call that throwing God a bone. When I'm in the shower and I'm doing my prayers because I'm busy with Dave's plan. You know, there's that wonderful line. We read it at almost every meeting. We stood at the turning point. I thought the turning point was when we came into Alcoholics Anonymous. For me, it's not. The turning point happens a thousand times a day. Dave's will or God's will. Which choice am I going to make? If I choose Dave's will, look out. The day is not going to turn out the way it should be. If I choose God's will, I have, a, I have hope. I have a chance of turning my life around. You know, I stand before you guys, the luckiest man in the world. I have been given the greatest gifts. I do not have a single problem today. Sometimes God puts issues in my life. And if I'm handling it right, I look to God and I say, okay, God, what do you want us to do? And then I go out and do whatever he asked me to do. Two weeks ago, I got to go spend some time with my brother. He's got stage four cancer. And he'd asked me to go spend some time with him and go do a retreat. And he and I went up and we, we did a retreat up in Camp Alta in Northern California. I'm okay with my brother. We're current. However that works out, we're current. The same kid that squared off to me and said that he believed in God, had stopped going to A meetings, couldn't even find his big book when I asked him to bring it with him to the, to the conference. And about three months before that, he'd said, I don't believe in God anymore. I put him back in our family with 80 drunks at this campground up in the middle of the mountains in the Sierras. The first day we were all talking.